Debbie, and welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you here today. Debbie, with your background in social work and your legal expertise, I know you have a tremendous amount you could offer, but I know today our focus is on one specific topic. So before we get into that, is there anything you would like to say about what you're doing these days or what's bringing you joy in this moment? Well, I, I am just enjoying being a um, stepmother and a former foster parent. We have uh, my husband, I've never had biological kids, but just between my husband's kids and my former foster kids, um, I've collected seven kids and 10 grandkids, and I am just enjoying being part of the, their lives and, and the family. And it's really clear that your heart is full. Oh, yes. I, I um, you know, the, the most important relationships of my life have have come by very strange and odd ways, but um, I, I thoroughly enjoy Enjoy them and cannot imagine my life any other way. It's not easy being a step parent. It's oh, not no. easy being a foster parent. It's not easy being a parent. That's Relationships right. in general are difficult, but being a step parent, being a foster parent is a unique relationship and they're not both the same. They each have their own distinct qualities about them and you've had experience in both. Would you tell us how you got started with foster parenting? Well, I think it goes back to um, when I was growing up, my parents were always working with at-risk kids and with youth organizations and doing a lot of ministries in our church. So, so I grew up with that heart for, um, back then we called them at-risk kids. Then I, when I got out of college, I spent a few years as a social worker worker. And uh, frankly, I just burned out. I, I got tired of dipping out the ocean with a teaspoon. Mm -hmm. And so I retreated to law school, but I stayed um, interested in working. And then when I got out of law school and started uh, my legal career with legal jobs, I managed to find some jobs that, that I was able to work um, with being a foster parent, and, and it was because of my social work background. I had just seen the need for people to be foster parents or mentors or whatever they could do to um, invest in the lives of, of one child at a time, and that was my goal. So I started out actually working as a, um, a, an emergency um, shelter or emergency foster a parent, um, just, you know, taking kids who needed somewhere for two days up to two weeks and while the social worker found a permanent placement for them. And then I moved into respite care, which was working um, to, to give a family a respite, a, a break, um, either one weekend at a time or every weekend or a, a few days while, you know, if, if parents had to travel, for example, I was a, a, an option as a licensed foster parent. And uh, then from there, I moved into full-time foster care, long-term placement. And I know we can't get into specifics with privacy laws and whatnot, so please understand my questions aren't asking for specifics, but right. what are some of those experiences that really stand out for you? Well, I think there's, there's several experiences, you know, I, my experience is, is better with older kids. I, I don't understand babies and not ever having had them. And, um, uh, plus my personality, I, I, I used to joke with my brother and sister that, that their children, when they were babies were sweet and wonderful, but, but basically boring <laughs> until they could argue with me. So, um, so my style works better with, with older kids. So what that meant is I would get kids who, you know, by the time they came to me, they had a lot of years of trauma behind them and some, it was physical abuse, some it was sexual abuse, but there was always some level of, um, of 
problems, what we now recognize as adverse childhood experiences and trauma. And so, you know, you'd have kids who'd react in different ways. Um, in, in my book, I talk about um, the, the one child who, he was, it was a respite placement, but he just, um, I, I couldn't contain his energy and it couldn't, didn't know what to do, how to help him un, until the weekend when he discovered um, my hammer and some old boards in my garage. And um, he just started pounding away on that board. And that, that was what um, gave him an outlet and kept him calm and fascinated for the times that he visited with me. Um, and, and I have friends who've read that story and relatives who've read it and said, okay, see, so you had a child with hyperactivity and anger issues and you gave him a hammer. I said, um, yes, I did. <laughs> and it, it worked beautifully. Um, something about the outlet for his aggression and the, the um, repetition was calming. And um, I, I bought scrap lumber. I bought roofing nails for him because they had the wide head and the short shank. And um, it gave him just immediate gratification to ha end up with a board covered with roofing nails. And um, that, you know, that's one where my desperation <laughs> stumbled across something that, that worked quite well. Um, it happens a lot. It's it does with parenting. You just kind of stumble into things and, and if they work, you go with it, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, I, I had uh, some kids who ran away a lot. Um, that's, it is, um, it, 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 social workers say runaways run away. It's what they do. It's how they cope. And so it, it doesn't take a lot for kids to decide to run away. Sometimes it was, it was, um, you know, uh, frustrations or high stress, so like a, a disagreement over grades or chores or something. But um, I had not expected, looking back now, of course, I recognize it. But at the time, I wasn't experienced enough to recognize that even good days could prompt a runaway episode because it was so unfamiliar to them. And particularly when we were getting along and having a good day and they were getting attached. Um, they would push away because in their experience, whenever they got attached to someone, something terrible happened. So they would push people, including me, away just to protect themselves. You know, and experience that in, in healthy adults too. And then we found yeah. that, you know, emotions are powerful things and we don't always know what to do with them and with the yeah. energy that they produce inside of us. Well, caring about people makes you vulnerable and, um, kids who are tired of being vulnerable, um, will, will resist being vulnerable. And as adults, you know, I, there's a lot of, um, foster parents, one of, whenever I go to, to meetings or groups with foster parents or even step parents, the, the, a constant thing that comes up so frequently um, particularly parenting older kids is just how do you keep caring about kids when they keep rejecting you? Because it requires a high level of letting ourselves be vulnerable um, to kids that are actively rejecting us. And that that's tough. That's a tough place to be. It is. And I think a lot of folks experience that with their kids in their teenage years, especially. Oh, yes. The kids go had, through it, phases that they just don't appreciate you. They don't, by all evidence present, even like you much. But right. To, to love through that stage, that's hard. It It is very difficult because uh, with, I, I, I joke that with teenagers, um, it's part of their job to to reject you and to be ungrateful. Um, it, it just is what they do and they go through that. And, and to some degree, we have to realize with these kids, um, no matter how much we love and care about them, they don't have the life experiences or the, the frontal lobe development, quite frankly, um, 
to understand the efforts that we're going to, to make their world the way it is. And, and part of that is developmental and part of that is uh, it's just the way it's supposed to be, you know, I mean, on some level, kids shouldn't have to worry, um, about all the things that go into making the world the way it is I, when they do worry about it too much, for example, if they start worrying about whether there will be electricity or whether there will be food in the refrigerator or any of these other things, baselines that they take for granted, if, if they start worrying about that, it's a sign that, that we're not doing our job. And, um, we, we call that, you know, an adverse experience for the kids. So on some level, we're supposed to be doing things that are invisible to them and uh, at the same time, we're supposed to be preparing them for adulthood where they have to know enough about it, um, particularly as teenagers, to be able to start moving towards taking responsibility for themselves. Um, and teenagers, of course, they, they just, they want the freedom and without the responsibility. And that's a developmental stage too. And it, there's no avoiding it. Yeah, and finding that balance is so hard. But it is. Put enough so that they're not feeling responsible for, but they are getting some experience in uh, finances, budgeting, uh, balancing different things that want your attention in life. That's a hard right. thing to do. It, it, it really is. And there's a lot of different techniques. I, 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 uh, I've learned a lot from other foster parents and, and techniques that work well with, uh, with our kids. Um, all of my kids, for example, when they got to a certain age, I started making them responsible for, for washing their clothes, um, and started offloading some responsibility. Um, we also started giving them, you can call it allowances, but basically I just figured out how much money I spent on them for X, Y, Z. Um, and just start giving it to them and letting them have control over it. So when they were younger, for example, they were responsible for all of their um, entertainment. Uh, I gave them, we gave them a certain amount and then they had the opportunity to make more money with chores and they could lose money for not doing their chores or having bad grades or, or whatever. Uh, and when they ran out of money, they ran out of money. We didn't buy any extra toys for them or, or anything. And then as I got older, when they got into the teenage years, I started offloading. Um, I just gave them a budget for their clothes. And, um, so whenever they said, can I have such and such? The question was, do you have enough money? I've already given you your money for this month. Um, and, and you know, we had to, I remember one child I had who I kept pointing out winter's coming up, you need a winter coat. And this child kept finding really cool shoes and other stuff on sale and cold weather hit. And I'm not going to say they had no coat because of course, you know, you, you, you can't safely let kids live with all the consequences of their decisions. Um, but the coat that was available was a, a hand-me-down, um, uh, from, uh, me and my husband. It was, it was, you know, secondhand and, and not at all fashionable or cool. Um, and I, I, I still remember the discussions and the arguments over, <laughs> I expected them to wear that coat. No, I expected them to have saved their money and bought the coat they wanted. And since they didn't, that was the only option. <laughs> and the, you know, this is the way that they, you might have a closet full of really cool shoes, but you needed a coat. And so it was, um, it, you know, that gets into letting them live with the consequences of their decisions and, and, you know, you care about them. You, you, um, again, you don't, you know, hand them the electric electricity bill. Well, I do for my adult kids that live at home, but teenagers, no, they just, they just are responsible for taking care of, again, their allowance. And if they want more money, there's, there's always, there's always plenty to be done that I can let them do instead of hiring someone else. So, um, you know, yeah. whatever the market rate is, the, if, if they do as good a job, <laughs> they didn't make that amount of money. <laughs> it's 
So how many years did you spend as a foster parent? Um, I think I actively was a foster parent for about 10 years, but then, um, the, um, uh, two of my kids, uh, they, they're not related to each other and they lived with me at different times, but they, um, aged out, out of the system, but still lived with me and I still took care of them and still supported them. Um, you know, that's, uh, that, that's what you do. were made. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that it, with biological kids, you, not all parents, some parents do, but not all parents will cut them off at age 18. And, and, um, certainly my family didn't, and we would, um, you know, we just, we just kept the ties and kept the connections there. It's beautiful. And then later you got married and you had stepchildren. Yes. I, my husband, um, had, um, five kids, only three, only two of them were at home. The other three were adults at the time. And so I, um, moved into, again, I, I was, I was the plan B parent <laughs> because that's, um, as a foster parent and as a step parent, I was coming into a role that, um, the kids, even when they accepted me, they, they really would, would rather have had their biological family still intact. Um, that was, I, I tell the story about our youngest son at one point, his, his mom asked for custody and, um, you know, so we were, we were looking, going down this court proceeding and, and we were trying to get, um, our son, my, my husband's youngest son, my stepson, um, to, to tell us his preference. And he just wasn't, he was not going to say anything that sounded like he was taking sides. And of course we weren't asking him to take sides. We just didn't want to spend a lot of time and resources and energy on something if he was totally opposed to it. And, um, finally my husband said to him, well, look, if, if you had a magic wand, what would your life look like? And this child didn't hesitate at all. He said, if I had a magic wand, dad, you and mom would still be together. And there was this sort of pause. And then he looked over at me and said, no insult, Debbie, you, you and the dogs would be right next door. <laughs> and so, you know, th this child and I had bonded. We were really tied. He was the youngest. I came into his life at a time when, when kids are, are more willing to bond with, with step parents. And, um, we did and still do adore each other. We have a great relationship, but I understood it wasn't about me. I didn't take it personally. It's just that uh, kids would rather have their parents together. And, um, he literally would have loved having me as a neighbor or a teacher or a basketball coach or something, you know, as long as you were in his life, as, as long as I was there somewhere. And as long as his parents were back together. Um, and so that was, was one thing that I, that I learned that I, being a plan B parent, um, it, it sounds terrible, but it, it's pretty wonderful if you're, if you're willing to recognize that you're not the person who's supposed to be in their lives and, and that's okay. So what are some tips and strategies you can give to those of us who might find ourselves in that situation as a plan B parent? So, well, first of all, recognize that you're not supposed to be there and from the kid's perspective, um, and that you never will be the person who's supposed to be there and, and that's okay. So. You're, you're not trying to replace their parent. Um, if you, if you try to replace their parent in, in, in the sense of just taking it over, or if you let it turn into a competition, you're going to lose. Um, it doesn't matter how wonderful you are. Um, you will always lose to those biological ties. It's just a, it's a, I think it's a primal urge it's beyond logic and it doesn't matter how wonderful you are you, you you don't have the biological ties um so the role i always urge people to go to is is i look at at the fact that um to, to use the framework of storytelling um you know we we are a storytelling species we are hardwired 
to think in terms of stories and that's how we make sense of our world. And so our kids develop a narrative of their lives. And if you look at all the great stories, they, they have a lot of different aspects, but they all have um, a, a, a hero who is trying to get to a goal and a villain who is stopping them and then a mentor who is helping them reach that goal. Well, you know, in a kid's story, they're always the hero and that leaves two roles for us. We're either the <laughs> villain or the mentor. And um, the, the, the villain role is actually sitting right there for us. There, there's, a, there's just a strong presumption to put us in the, in the villain role. It, it's in all the old stories. Uh, I, I used to joke with my kids that um, I had never been a step parent before, but, but I had read the manuals. So I, I understood Cinderella and um, Hansel and Gretel and Snow White. So I, so I had this down, how to be a stepmother. Um, and, and of course, it, it was a joke. Um, but if we can move ourselves into that mentor role, which is not the same as a parent, but it's a caring, concerned person who has their back, who's always watching out for their interests, who is um, more or less wise. Um, and, and I always is find it very reassuring uh, when I'm reading these stories to realize that mentors don't have to be patient. They don't have to be brilliant. <laughs> you know, there's, that's right. There's, there's just a lot of things that we don't have to be. Um, but we do have to have, uh, we do have to care about the kids. We do have to have unconditional love. Um, I make a point in my book, in my writing, it's not unconditional commitment because commitment has to have strong boundaries. All healthy relationships have boundaries. And that's another thing that mentors do for kids is they set very clear boundaries. Um, and if the kids, you know, get past those boundaries, they, they have consequences and structure. So, um, but at the same time, they offer structure. The mentors offer a lot of concern and caring and high, a lot of high nurturing, a lot of saying to them, I, yeah, you screwed up, but I love you just the way you are. And, um, I think that probably is one of the most important things that we can say to them is learning how to, how to say to kids, uh, we knew that that wasn't the smartest decision you've ever made. And, and we're still good. I, I still love you and care about you. So tell us about your book. Well, it's um, titled Raising Other People's Children um, because that's what I felt like I've, I've done. I've, I, I, uh, I've always joked I make my living as a lawyer, um, but what I do is raise other people's kids. And there's a certain skill set to that. Although being a foster parent and being a step parent are, are very different, there's still a lot of ways in which they're very similar. And so I talk about those principles, the fact that, that we're not the person who's supposed to be there, um, principles for how to deal with the person who is supposed to be there. Sometimes that person is there. Um, sometimes they're intermittently there. Sometimes they're not there at all. And there's always different ways of, of helping kids to do that, understanding that, that our role with kids are, are one of our jobs is to, to help them have as healthy a relationship as they can with their biological parents, um, to learn how to work with whatever is there. Um, I, I talk about, um, some of the, the principles of, you know, uh, one of the things that, that I talk about with, with traumatized kids, and, and I think we have to understand that kids who have lost a parent through divorce um, have suffered trauma. We, we tend to try to normalize that and say the kids are fine, the kids are resilient. But the hard data shows that, that children of divorce, um, they, have a lot of, they have a lot of problems. And that, that's not to... to criticize parents. Sometimes divorce is the only um, sane, situa sane solution to an insane situation. And, and I never um, will pass judgment. But, you know, the, the analogy I like to use is whenever you say, for example, that 
um, that cancer drugs have side effects. That doesn't mean you're anti-cancer drugs. It just means you, you have to recognize and deal with the side effects. So when we are, are working with children of divorce, it, it, it doesn't mean we're pro-abuse any more than we're pro-cancer. It just means we have to recognize the, the side effects of the divorce and um, to recognize that there's certain things that just come with that territory and, and uh, spaces that we need to fill in. And it's going to be our job to fill those in. And so, um, you know, one of the principles I talk about is commitment is stronger than love. Uh, I, I, I can love a lot of people, but if, when you make a commitment, it has to be a one-way commitment to kids. You have to keep caring about them, even when they're rejecting you. It, it, it's heavy lifting, but it's, it's the only way to, to build a relationship with them. Uh, unlike adult relationships, adult, uh, our relationships with our kids, they're always one way. They're, you know, they're, they're not adults. And, um, being in, like, a, like I said earlier, being ungrateful and rejecting you is, it's part of their job. <laughs> it's, part of, it's part of how they process the world. And, um, I, I remember our, um, youngest son, um, who right uh, a few years after I got married, um, it was, it wasn't, it was within the first year, um, it, I was telling him good night one night and he, um, we, you know how kids are. He would also talk, talk about what was on his mind that day or whatever. In this particular night, he said, um, Debbie, whenever you and dad break up and I said, we're, we're not going to break up. And he said, yeah, yeah, whatever. If you and dad break up, um, uh, can I come live with you? And the, I, 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 of course, told him he could and went and told my husband, you know, don't, don't, don't ever mess with me because not only will I take everything you own, but I get kids too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it was flattering, but I realized that, um, there was a sad aspect to it, which was he was just convinced that all marriages break up. He had never seen one stay together. And so he was trying to you know, prepare his world and, and, and make sure that I stayed in it, um, to some degree. And, um, if the, I, I guess maybe 10 years later, what well, sometime within the past three or four years, I was talking to him about that incident and, and he said, yeah, he used to worry about that a lot. And, and I asked him, um, when he quit worrying about it and, and what made him quit worrying about it. And he stopped for a minute and thought, and he said, well, you're still here. And, and I, I realized, you know, we can say a lot of things to our kids, but the fact that we care about them, that we love them, that we're going to be a part of their lives, they're not going to believe it just from words. They just have to see it. And that's the only thing that will convince them is when they can look around and say, oh, yeah, she's, she's still here. Debbie, you have so much wisdom, and I would encourage every parent, whether you're a step-parent or not, there are so many good lessons to be found here. So get a copy of Raising Other People's Children. You can get it at raisingotherpeopleschildren.com or the, click on the link in the show notes here, and it'll take you right there. Uh, Debbie, before we leave, I do need to touch on something that was mentioned way back at the beginning of this. Okay. You said that, well, the way I heard it anyway, was that you want to have relationships with children who argue with you. So my question is, where do we send them? And how does that work? How does that work? <laughs> Unfortunately, right now, all of um, our adult kids have moved back home temporarily, or they keep saying it's temporarily. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you definitely can reach me at uh, DebbieOsborne.com, or it, it may be easier to just to look at RaisingOtherPeople'sChildren.blog, which is where I have my blog, and you, you can email me, and um, I, I will walk through 
with you how to survive those years until the aliens return their brains. <laughs> and but, so we don't send our argumentative kids to. Yes. Well, I'll take them for a weekend. No, I, can, I, I can take them for a weekend and convince them that their lives really are not that bad back at your place. <laughs> Good enough. Well, Debbie, this has been a delight, and I've learned a lot. I hope others have too. And thanks for writing such a meaningful and relevant and important book. Thank you very much for your time. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Me too. Bye-bye. <laughs>